Did you go over any of the questions that I... Uh, you didn't send me any questions. I did, too, send you questions. You liar. I'm not lying. You're Let me this, see. You're getting all this? You're getting this, this? Let me see those questions. Would you like to see these questions? Was I ever in prison? <laughs> Sexual? Oh, where's the I, jar? Where's you, the never, jar? you never fucking sent me questions. Where's the jar? <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. You have, we have to be in a jar. <laughs> On camera, in front of us. You never gave me questions. I did, yeah. I, I did. swear to God, I'm going to look in the email and I'll kill you. You're so lame. Of course I gave you questions. You did? Yeah. Sorry, man. All right. Is he, we're rolling now. We're going to... All right. All right. We're going to ask you... You've got to look at me. You're, make believe I'm uh, morally safer. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to bust me on something I did in 1981? Yeah, we're going to talk all about the uh, banging the hookers and uh, whatever. Anyway. All right. Let's start... Duke, share with us your first recollections of music when you were growing up. What, was it in Albany? In Albany. I grew up in the north end of Albany. The white Irish Catholic isolated, unevolved north end of Albany. But my early memories, I have three older brothers and a sister. And my oldest brother, Joe, he must be 12 or 13 years older than me. I remember him playing drums on the ironing board to Beach Boys songs on the radio just seemed like forever, you know, just standing, staring out the window and just playing, you know. And my mom was a great singer, okay. and she would have the radio on and sing with Tommy Dorsey stuff back when it was called WROW in Albany. They'd play all that stuff. She was a singer who sang constantly, and my brother Joe was playing that. My sister, who hit the hippie age, had all the great albums, all the Neil Young stuff, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Um, the Janis Joplin, the Hendrix, I mean, Traffic, she was a huge Traffic fan. And I'm, to this day, a Traffic fanatic. So she had all these great records, you know. And then in between her and Joe was my brother Tom, but he had been in the Air Force in England. And then he came back from England with a stack of vinyl, which was eye-opening, you know. What did he come back with? Just tons of stuff. I mean, like, uh, I think it was my introduction to Deep Purple. He had the Live at the Albert Hall album, which he actually attended. And um, just a bunch of stuff. And I remember him playing air guitar, you know, and I was like 11. And I'm looking at, wow, it works. <laughs> it was totally working for me, this whole thing. And then my brother Paul was into a, a lot of great stuff. You know, there was a huge blues explosion in the early 70s. Right, yeah. John Lee Hooker, you know, all these guys doing London Sessions records. and. And yeah, and Albert King and Freddie King were huge again, you know, on tours. And so my brother Paul was into all that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that enough, you know, those influences added up. And, you know, I remember seeing the Beatles, I think it was the last concert, Candlestick Park or something, some late concert there on yeah. stage. But anyway, an older brother, my friend Paul, who had all the blues records, he's six years older. His, his, one of his best friends was a bass player, Eddie Torje, who lived down the hill. And uh, that's why I started playing bass. Okay, so he's the guy that got you hooked up into bass. Completely. He taught me everything, you know. The first jazz record I ever got was from him. It was On the Corner by Miles Davis. I didn't know what to do with that. But I stuck <laughs> with it, you know. I hung in there. And he just started turning me on to a number of... He had gone to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And Schofield and all these guys were there. I mean, Berkeley was yeah. like pretty musical at that time. And uh, so he would come back with these great records. He turned me on the coal train and all that. And then... Did he train you formally, like technique and reading and theory? Yeah. Okay. I became a very good reader because of him. Wow. Um, back when reading mattered, yeah. you know. He... he split and then I started, he went back, he went on the road and I started studying with the baritone sax player, Nick Brignola, jazz player. So anyway, uh, that was a great experience. But Eddie and I went on to play duets for years, okay. like all until I was an adult. Mm -hmm. We would play duets and he would talk to me and teach me on a lot, everything I know about articulation. Mm -hmm. Play all these duet pieces and, uh, you know, the length of a note attacking a note, mm -hmm. the crucial stuff, mm -hmm. holding a long note, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. Most important stuff there is in my book. So that's, you know. Sorry, it's just you knocking it. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. You're just a fidget. <laughs>
We'll edit that out, right? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> so, so. Uh, now what? Now this at this time. Now you, of course, we met when you went to the University of Miami. This is going right. to be seventy nine eighty. What? What? You seem to have been getting a good grounding in musical education. What prompted you to go to University of Miami? Because I scammed my way out of Albany High School. <laughs> I got out of Albany High with a 62 and a half average because I never went. What, what is the average? Uh, 65. Okay. It's legal. <laughs> so I totally scammed my way out. It's a long evol involved story. Yeah, I'll spare you. But I read in Guitar Player magazine an interview with Steve Morris of the Dregs right. where he said something like he had gotten to Miami without a high school diploma. Okay. So I just started practicing my ass off and sent a tape and got accepted. Wow. And... Uh, that turned out to be a crucial move because, you know, Miami was really technically oriented. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of just exercises and learning the, the instrument. I, and I didn't, at the time, I thought this is a little, a little too much. And, uh, but well, now... There, there also was a very heavy emphasis on bebop and a music that was dead there. That really, you know, how could you possibly apply all trombone etudes and... Charlie Parker. Yeah, I know. To that's what, what, you, what you wanted to do. That's what I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Uh, but now I look back at my time at U Miami as just strictly like a boot camp for physicality. Mm -hmm. When I got to William Parrish University, run by William, uh, Rufus Reed, that was all about playing. When did you start that? When I went there in '84 and graduated. Okay. The Green Jazz Performance. <clears throat> and Joe Lovano was teaching there, and. Harold Mayburn playing piano and just all these amazing musicians from the New York area because mm -hmm. of the short drive. Right. Jim McNeely and Dave Samuels and that was about playing and memorizing standards and Norman Simmons who was uh, Sarah Vaughan's pianist, you know, I mean he just simplified everything for me because standards were a big mystery, you know, listening to him and transcribing solos, like I couldn't really patch it together. And I knew I didn't want to be a jazz musician. I wanted to be a rock or R&B musician. I just went to learn more about harmony. But Norman said one day, he said, you know, they're just songs, man. Learn the lyrics. And they'll just become songs to you. They won't become these mathematical tests. So once I started doing that, I realized, yeah, music is music is music, you know. And that was, you know, I, I learned an awful lot there. Just that, that is a radical approach to the way music is taught in schools. Completely opposite, you know. Everything's like yeah, you play this two five. I mean, a lot of guys were, you know, sitting around writing out Mike Stern two fives and practicing until they were turning purple. And I was thinking, you're just going to sound like a guy who's learning Mike Stern two fives. <laughs> <laughs> you know, memorize it, man. Knock yourself out. It's a fucking, it's a car with no gas. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I, and during but during school, I was playing weekend gigs with J.R. Montrose who was the tenor player on the Charles Mingus record, Pithcanthropus erectus, which is a sort of a pivotal mm -hmm. Mingus record. And he had played a lot with Kenny Dorham and stuff, and that was just an incredible learning experience. Mm -hmm. He never said a word to me. He just called me back. Okay. And that's, that's what those cats were doing, the older jazz guys, which most, most of them are gone. He was a hard bopper. I mean, he used Coltrane's rhythm section on these blue note records he had of his own. But he also gave me my worst gig nightmare. Which is? <laughs> JR called me one day, man. He was a funny old guy, you know. And he called me one day and he said, hey, kid, what are you doing Saturday? And for him, I, even if I had something, I'd say nothing. And I'd figure it out after the phone call. So he goes, meet me at the Del Mar VFW, like 1 o'clock. I'm like, all right. It was somebody's wedding. You know, it was the strangest gig. Um, but JR had split his lip. And he couldn't, he couldn't really play much. And it was a duo. So JR would play the melody to, you know, was this thing called love or something? He'd go, you got it. And I'd be soloing for, you know, 30 choruses or more. Just looking at him like, I've said all I had to say about 15 minutes ago, JR. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed like a nightmare at the time. But, man, it just, it was an eye opener. I was like, wow, I need to sit down and explore my ideas, wow. lengthen them, you know. Wow. Uh, even though that I didn't want to be a jazz guy. Right. 
It was a little, it was a, it was a boot camp. Now, you, was it around that time that you got your gig with uh, when did when we, Blood, Sweat, and Tears? When did that come along? Was that much later? That came along after I fin finished college. I moved into the city. Right. Yeah. I remember, right. I got a. I, I was I was doing anything to make my rent because I literally you know I put myself through college and I had nothing when I moved there. I got like a month's rent, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, what was the scene like in New York City at the time? It was long hair, rock. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a series of bands that got signed to major labels that pff, you know vanished. Um, it was. Uh, there was a lot of work. I was working a lot, you know. But I had gotten this gig writing for guitar while transcribing bass lines and writing a column to pay rent. Uh, it was fun. I mean, I ended up transcribing like, I don't know, 500 plus tunes. Yeah. Some of it completely inane. But I learned from it all, yeah. you know. It's like I had to spend time transcribing some things I really couldn't tolerate, but it taught me a lot about patience and humility and <laughs> rent <laughs> and, and um, but I started subbing on the blood sweat and tears gig oh okay and who was the bass player you were subbing for anybody Gary Foote okay who was playing with Billy Cobham before that and some other plays with Smokey Robinson now okay. he and I shared a house in college with uh, a couple other guys okay Gary was a good buddy of mine Matter of fact, I, I pretty much knew everybody in the band, you know, from Miami or Patterson. Well, they were all hired guns at that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah had been for decades, yeah. you know. Um, so, but that was a great opportunity for me to see the world, or most of it. Mm -hmm. I had never, I mean, I had been doing clinics for Marshall and Korg mm -hmm. before that. So I would go to Britain and Japan and do things for them, but I had never toured proper you know in a bus mm -hmm. it's an entourage of like 13 or 14 people <laughs> and you know playing all over germany yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, i caught the show in sacramento or something but, but what was oh that? that's right yeah, i was there when you were opening up for a rod stewart impersonator and uh two dog night I think it was. <laughs> 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 but what <laughs> no, you came to the gig with Three Dog Night. Oh, was it three? They were three at that time. Okay. All right. Jimmy Greenspoon was there. That's right. I got to meet the great, like, great Jimmy Greenspoon. Well, what was that? What, I mean, that must have been, a, on some level, that must have been cool for you to step into the iconic role, even though they were past their prime, obviously. Well, you know, Jim Felder was a great bass player. He was And I, uh, I didn't play, like, I was playing a P bass with flat wounds, mm -hmm. probably much like Jim was. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I had stopped playing slap bass because right. I just didn't care for it much. It was overkill and I, I played it straight, you know. Uh, it's such a great book. I mean, it's a great book, man. And to play with a great horn section and a great rhythm section. It was a great band. That was a great band I was in. I was really lucky.